Lisa Dandy, welcome to Acting Prime Minister and thanks so much for coming on the podcast. Oh God, what have I let myself in for? <laughs> I can see that you're at home in Wigan right now. Yeah, it's, um, it's been a terrible year for all sorts of reasons, but one of the great things that has happened is that I have got to spend more time at home, which has been quite nice. Although there's a pile of Christmas cards behind you ready to sign, um, I think. I've just told you, well, before we started recording, that I was sitting strategically so that nobody would know that I've still got 900 Christmas cards to sign, and now you've told everybody. <laughs> How many do you have to send in a year? Well, well, I don't send them all year, obviously. I only send them no, no. at Christmas. <laughs> but um, it's, Christmas cards are a big deal in Lancashire. I don't know where you're from, but I grew up in Bury, and like, it really matters. Like People start sending them really early. My stepdad used to start sending them in October, which is a bit excessive, but um, you know, they, they're, they're a big deal around here, so I've got a lot left. Yeah, to be fair, they're a big deal in Wales as well, where I'm from, but I mean, 900 left to go, is that is that all of them, or have you had to do more on top of that? Uh, well, that's so that's like, you know, obviously I send one to all my party members and to lots of people that I've worked with over the year, and this year particularly, because I've hardly seen anyone. I mean, I've done a lot of this sort of thing, I've phoned people, but usually I just see people when I'm out and about in Wigan. And obviously we've been in lockdown here since the end of June. So we're just not seeing seeing each other. So I've got a lot more this year than I would normally have. Yeah, and you better enjoy that time at home because they're saying that Parliament might sit over Christmas now to get this Brexit deal through, if there's a Brexit deal. Well, this is true, although... I strongly suspect that most MPs won't be there because, you know, we've got this proxy voting system at the moment. So poor old Chris Elmore MP, who is my proxy, is probably going to have to be there going around the division lobbies voting 400 times. But <laughs> a lot of the rest of us will be sending him thank you messages while we're eating our Christmas dinner. OK, well, look, let's move on from you being an MP now, because the whole point of this podcast is to promote you to be Prime Minister for the next uh, half an hour or so. Wait, wait. <laughs> Yeah, so let's get you settled into number 10. And firstly, what is the personal item that you would take from home, do you think, if you were Prime Minister and you wanted to have some home comforts with you? Mm, well, I was sort of thinking about this. Do you know that scene in Love Actually where he's dancing around the... the I don't even know what room it is, but he's dancing around number 10. Oh, what, when Hugh Grant's doing the dance? It's like down the stairs and into the study and all that sort of thing, isn't it? Yeah, I know so the one. I was sort of wondering whether I should take my speaker and, you know, put some tunes on. But actually... Thinking about this year, the most likely item that I'd be... I don't know if I can describe him as an item, but the most likely thing I'd be taking to number 10 is my five-year-old son because childcare has been a major issue this year. So probably probably Otis, I would have thought. Excellent. And what's the drink that you'd pour yourself as you're kind of settling in to read through your red box? Um, well, I don't know what they've got on offer in Downing Street. I sort of, in, in a way, I sort of picture it like the West Wing, you know, the series where they used to wander into the kitchen at any time of day or night and be able to choose from sort of 40 flavours of ice cream. But I don't know, if, I'd, probably number 10 isn't quite set up for that sort of thing. So probably if I'm going to be Prime Minister for just one day, I'm going to have loads to do. So probably go for a great big giant coffee. Yeah, nice. And who's the first person you'd call? Uh, well, I, I was trying to think of something really clever to say about this. I think I've probably called my mum and say, guess where I am? <laughs> um, I mean, you've got to, haven't you? Um, but yeah. But then I'll get my act together. And I think I like the, you know, but making some calls to world leaders, I think, would be a good idea, given the amount of damage that we've done to our international relationships in recent years. So probably start with Simon Coveney in Ireland, I think. Um, okay. For us in Labour, the Good Friday Agreement is an absolute article of faith. And we've been so depressed about how needlessly antagonistic that relationship has become. So I'd probably call him first, after my mum. OK, good answer. We haven't had that one before. Lots of people phone the American president, but uh, I like I like that idea, the Taoiseach. Um, let's talk about your path to power now. So you were born in Manchester, where your mum produced documentaries for Granada Television. So she's one of the family at ITV. And um, while your dad, Deepak Nandi, is a Marxist academic who helped write Labour's Race Relations Act, you studied politics at Newcastle University and you worked for a homeless charity, Centrepoint, and also the Children's Society. And then you were elected as MP for Wigan in 2010 when you served in Jeremy Corbyn's shadow cabinet before quitting and helping to run Owen Smith's leadership campaign. And then you are now ultimately uh, shadow foreign secretary yourself after having a run at the top job, coming third this year behind Keir Starmer in the leadership election. So... 
let's start at the beginning. And your dad, I mean, there's been a lot that's been made of this, especially when you were running for leader. He is a, a Marxist academic. So where does your politics kind of come from? Because I think your grandfather was Frank Byers, who was a Liberal MP as well. So that's right. That's you, right. it's a bit of a mix. Yeah, I mean, it's a complete mix. Christmas Day in our family has always been quite interesting. There's usually an argument before we've even got the turkey out. So um, it's... I guess that I guess that is quite important to, to the way that I see the world, to be honest, partly because my dad's an immigrant. One of the things he always said to me, you know, came over here from Calcutta when he was in his late teens. And he's always said to me that you see you see the world at a bit of a tangent um, because you don't you know, although you, he's lived in this country for decades, he, he has a slightly different perspective coming from another country originally. And so that's always been a bit of an influence, but m mainly because, like you said, you've got people from lots of different political traditions in my family. And that, I suppose, is why I'm always interested in working right across the political spectrum. I think there's so much that you can learn from other political traditions. You know, my granddad was a liberal. He really believed in, in personal freedom as well as sort of societal freedom. He fought in the war and, you know, that shaped a lot of his thinking around that. But from my point of view, I've always just felt that to be genuinely free, to be able to exert choice and have options about your own life, that means you need to have the means, the economic means, in order to live that sort of, you know, open, open sort of rich, um, larger life. And that's why the Labour Party has always been my natural home. But it means that I work with people right across the political traditions, including, you know, at times people from the One Nation Tory tradition, which is under attack in the Tory party at the moment. But... You know, it's an important test for people like me in the Labour Party. We don't always get everything right. And listening to those other perspectives has always been something that's really sort of shaped me and the way that I do politics. And I think you joked before that your dad thinks you're right wing. <laughs> yeah, it's really Does he really? Does every time people bring that up. He says he's really proud of me and I should never have said it. <laughs> oh, but does, it, does he think that then? Is, I mean, is he quite clearly to the left of where you are? I think on, on most things, he probably is more, I don't really actually, I don't really want to put words in his mouth, to be honest. I think he just, you know, I mean, one of the things, for example, when I was growing up is that there's obviously a sort of, um, you know, the, 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 the communist tradition, for example, in Britain is something that, you know, people feel very very instinctively and understandably nervous about there's a you know if you look back at the history of communism there's a lot there's a lot of things that you would not want to emulate in our in our history um but you know if you look at it from the point of view of someone who was born and brought up in West Bengal you know the communist tradition in India is actually you know is actually quite present that you know, often you've got people who come from that tradition who are responsible for emptying your bins and keeping your streets clean. And I just, I guess what's important for me about my dad is that he's able to, to sort of question assumptions that we just accept here in Britain. He makes me think a bit harder and he makes me work a bit harder to make, to make the argument. And it's not that, it's not that he's particularly left and I'm particularly not left. It's just that he he makes he forces me to question things, and I think that's got to be a good thing. What did he make of Jeremy Corbyn? Because you obviously ran though in Smith's leadership campaign too. Was he was he sort of disappointed that you didn't back Jeremy Corbyn all the way? No, I mean he he comes from the Marxist tradition, right? And uh, I mean Jeremy, I think Jeremy is quite a complex character in in lots of ways. That you know, as a politician, I think on a domestic level, he and I have very very similar. Uh, a very similar outlook and actually when I was his shadow energy secretary one of the things that I found really rewarding was working on him on things like energy nationalization you know he was very keen to nationalize the energy companies and then when we were kicking it around we came up with this proposal about perhaps putting them into public hands rather than public ownership so you know the the public actually coming together and running those things themselves which he felt was a far more radical idea so it was kind of you know there was there was a, there was a lot of sort of synergy and stuff but you know my dad my dad spent years fighting um the race relations struggle in the UK and often that got him into all sorts of bother you know whether it was the far right or the hard left actually both of those groups were particularly um hostile to people who were trying to bring into force race relations legislation and a, 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 you know the institutions like the commission for racial equality uh, or its and the equal opportunities commission that 
foreshadowed it. And um, so he's, he's seen that before. He's seen what happens when uh, you get a culture in politics that is very, very uh, unaccommodating of challenge or dissent or difference. He's he suffered that himself throughout his political uh, throughout his life, and so he he actually was one of the people who saw saw this coming and saw what was about to happen to the Labour Party and saw the the way in which we descended into infighting, nastiness, the trying to shut down of debate and dissent. And actually, he got there before me, if I'm honest. When I resigned, I think he really did feel that I'd done not only the right thing, but in trying to, in sticking my neck out and trying to take us and get us to a better place. So he was one of my biggest supporters. And you talk about that nastiness. Do you feel as if the party is a nicer place now? Because there's still quite a lot of division going on, isn't there? I think something has shifted. I, I, you know, I, I don't want to overstate this, but I do think that the way that Becky and Keir and I conducted ourselves during the leadership contest was quite a big deal. I rang Keir really early on when I decided to run and said to him, I don't want this to become what I've seen leadership contests become before. You know, I've lived through quite a few now at close quarters. We have a sort of, you know, biannual leadership contest at the moment in the Labour Party. And, you know, I've seen different ways in which people have destroyed one another and in the process destroyed the the the, the Labour Party standing in the eyes of the public. And my feeling was that whoever won, whether it was Becky or Keir or me or Emily, Jess, Clive, you know, any other people who put their names forward, they had to come out of that process stronger, not weakened by it. And I think that that did help, actually. I, you know, I'm still in touch with all of the leadership candidates, still got a really good relationship with them. And I, I think we modelled the sort of behaviour that we wanted to see next. And so, you know, in the debates that we have about things like Brexit and so on, it feels like something has shifted, definitely. I'm not saying we're there yet, got work to do, especially on anti-Semitism, but it does feel like we're, we've moved. Obviously, there has been a little bit of uh, divisive stuff going on lately with Jeremy Corbyn having the whip suspended. And there have been CLPs, local Labour Party branches, that have been putting forward motions in support of him. They've now been asked to not do that and stop from doing that. Do you worry that, that this divide is just never going to go away, that this is never going to really heal? Uh, I don't. I mean, I think what happens next is largely up to us. And obviously, you know, being in the shadow cabinet again and you know, working very closely with Keir and the team, I feel that we have a particular responsibility to behave right. So, you know, when when Keir said we're not, you know, this is not a political decision. I'm not, I'm, you know, we've got to we've got to have an independent process for how we deal with things like that. I really support him. It becomes very difficult, you know, when I come on, come on, like you know, ITV and get hit by with people like you saying, "Come on, what is your view? What is your view?" It is very uncomfortable. I'm I'm the sort of politician that just wants to level with people about what I really think. But actually, in this instance, what I think is not relevant. It's you know, it, what's important is that we have an independent process that considers facts in the round that people are given the benefit of the doubt that they're able to make their own case, and then a judgment is formed. And um, I, I think we've done, I think we've done okay with that at every level of the party over the last few months. But we, we're starting from a, a very difficult place, and there's no question that we, we're going to have to keep working at it. Okay. Well, look, something else that you're all passionate about is towns. <laughs> there have been all sorts of memes about your love of towns. <laughs> and you said on the you said on election night last year when Labour suffered its worst defeat since the 1930s. This has been a long time coming. They've been telling us in towns like Wigan for some time that all is not right. I have listened. I've heard you. I will make my mission from this day forward to bring Labour home to you. Do you think Labour is coming home? And and if so, what signs are there that Labour's coming home to towns like Wigan, do you think, so far? Um, So I guess the first thing is that one of the first things that Keir set up was something called Call Keir, where he... Um, at the moment is Zoom calls because of you know lockdown rules, but he's he's been Zooming with people in towns across Britain. Um, he started in Bury, which is where I grew up. My mum was on the call, keeping tabs on him, um, just to see what he would say. But actually, I think there was a general sense from from the people on that that this was real. This is you know that we've we've listened and we've understood that we're not asking people to come to us and talk on our territory that meeting was absolutely given over it's you know it's your typical town hall meeting and it was given over to people to talk about the issues that matter to them so that we don't get into a situation again where we're talking about free broadband when people are saying to us all I want is a functioning bus network and 
I, you know, I banged on about these things till I'm blue in the face. I saw you smiling there when I said it, but you know, this does matter and it's not got better. It's only got worse over the last 40 years. And what where we've been previously is in this sort of place where when people say to us, but my high street's falling apart, we say, this is progress, you know, get on board or get out of the way. Well, that's just not good enough. That's politics is, is about trying to face up to what people most need and want in their lives and find, you know, grapple with the reality of where we are and find creative ways to make that happen. And I think, I feel like that's that's the sort of you know that's the that's the that's the energy that is powering the the shadow cabinet at the moment that we you know when I look across the board whether it's on housing or foreign policy which I do or um you know how to keep this country safe which is Nick Thomas Simmons leads on how to make an economy that works for every part of Britain which Annalisa Dodds is dealing with I just feel like there is this sense that we've got to do things differently and start to deliver on people's priorities and so you know we're not there yet but I feel like when Keir says give us a second look when people look I think they they may be pleasantly surprised by what they start to see. The election was a year ago today which I can't quite believe I feel like this year has just disappeared into a black hole of wasted time and horrendous events but um, a study this week by the the group Labour for the North said that the red wall seats actually aren't returning to Labour yet there's no sign of that and they're worried that they may be lost forever I mean I guess that's something you have been talking about for a long time saying that we can't take these towns and these northern seats for granted that there is a longer term trend here but do you think it is reversible because it doesn't seem at the moment as if there's that much of a sign of the red wall coming home. I, don't, I was talking to Gloria de Piero about this the other day. Do you remember just after the election, um, we went to Ashfield to go and knock on some doors and try and see, you know, how, how just try and get let people speak themselves about what had just happened and give them a voice. But also for me, it was about testing out, you know, do I actually need to do this to myself? Do I have to do I have to step forward and say we've got to fundamentally change and I'm I'm running to be leader? And the conclusion that we came to was yes, actually after that, because people felt so strongly. I think there are I think there are I think there are people are on a, a, a different sort of continuum, right? So when I said at, after the election last year, this has been coming for a long time, some people have already moved away from us. They they, they had misgivings uh, in the latter years of the new Labour government. They, they continued to move away from us under Ed Miliband. And then, you know, that accelerated under Jeremy Corbyn. And once they've gone, it's not just that they, they stop voting at first and then they move to another political party. And once they've done that, it becomes very, very difficult in places where Labour runs through people's DNA and family history. It becomes very, very difficult to win them back. That sense of utter betrayal that we've left them you have to work incredibly hard. And I think I think we've got huge amounts of work to do to get that right. But there are there are another group of people who just felt at this election, some because of Brexit and some because of the direction of travel under under Jeremy, that they were being utterly disrespected. And when I talked to Gloria about it the other day, she said that they'd been vox popping in Ashfield for her Times radio show. And people were starting to come back. Those that group of people were starting to come back. They felt that we had had a level of humility about what had happened and what we'd got wrong. And they're at the very least starting to look look at us again. They want to come back, that group, I think, but they want to know that we've come back to them. And that was why I stood in the end in the leadership contest. I just felt that if they looked at that that contest and saw a group of people who just did not own up to what had happened and our role in it, then we would be finished amongst that group of voters. And, you know, they're not just voters to me. I'm looking out my window here. They're my friends, my neighbours, my constituents. It really is personal for me. And so, you know, I, I think we're, we're on the right trajectory, but we've, we've, we've you know, we've, we're starting from a really difficult place. We've got huge amounts of work to do. OK, well, let's assume that you do the work and that you do win enough red wall seats back and that you are Prime Minister again, don't forget. Um, and let's talk about some of the challenges on your desk as Prime Minister. Firstly, Brexit, which is very topical this week. If you were Boris Johnson at this point, if you were Prime Minister, what would you compromise on that he hasn't compromised on already to get this deal across the line? 
Well, I guess, I mean, the, the two sort of big outstanding issues, state aid and fish, I've spent a lot of time talking about fish over the last eight months, by the way. I now know a lot more about fish than I knew before. Which in a coastal <laughs> constituency like Wigan is exactly <laughs> not. Although we're very famous for Orwell's Road to Wigan Pier, there isn't actually really a Wigan Pier. Um, so, <laughs> Um, the, the kind of jo- jokes on on everyone else, but we, um, uh, you know, those two outstanding issues. There is there is no reason why we shouldn't have been able to find some kind of compromise around that. During the leadership contest, I went to Grimsby to meet people who work in the fisheries industry there, and one of the things they were saying to me is that a lot of the business now is um, it's a it's a sort of import export business that they actually import fish from elsewhere they prepare the fish and then they export it to other parts of Europe so you know from their point of view this is a really getting some kind of deal around this and you know agreeing some fishing quotas so that we can continue to trade it's important to the fisheries industry that we have in this country on state aid I mean the government's got itself into a really bizarre position on state aid where they appear to be holding out for more flexibility on state aid provisions with the EU than they wanted from the trade deal with Japan I mean it just doesn't it's ideological now and although I I absolutely feel that the EU's opening position on both of those things was unreasonable and if we'd been in government I would have been pushing very hard for us to push back on that and say to the EU come on you need to move closer to us and you need to compromise. There is absolutely no reason at this stage why the government shouldn't be able to find an agreement around those things. And if they do get an agreement should Labour vote for it? Um, so it, 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 you're going to hate this, right? But we do need to see it. And the reason that we need to see it, people keep asking me, well, given how bad no deal would be, what on earth would prompt you to reject a deal? And I you know, very much agree with the sense of that. I believe that getting a deal is absolutely essential, not because it represents the ceiling of what we can achieve with the EU, but because it represents the floor. And without a floor to build on, we're in really serious trouble. Foreign policy, security, defence, all those issues taken off the table by our government. But we, we've got to have a level of cooperation with Europe on those issues. And without a floor, we're going to have difficulty. But the reason that I keep saying that we need to see that deal is, for example, it would be really hard to imagine 27 EU member states signing off a deal that compromised the Good Friday Agreement. But it was only in the last 24 hours that we started to have some movement around the Northern Ireland Protocol. And we could not support a deal in the Labour Party that put the Good Friday Agreement at risk, that created a hard border between Northern Ireland and Ireland. And although I really accept that the EU was instrumental in creating the conditions in which the Good Friday Agreement was able to come into force and that, you know, they've very much sided with Ireland and made sure that they, they've been quite tough on that... Nevertheless, the EU is not a co-guarantor of the Good Friday Agreement. The UK is. And for us in Labour, that is an absolute article of faith upholding the Good Friday Agreement. So we've got to see it before we can uh, vote for a deal. But, you know, it's important that we get a deal. And we've never shied away from saying that. A A deal is absolutely essential. But I mean, instinctively, where are you with all of this? Because you were you were leaning towards voting for a deal under Theresa May. So, I mean, I would imagine that you would quite like to vote for a deal if if the deal is, if there is a deal, basically. Yeah, I mean, it's getting a bit confused about what constitutes a deal and what doesn't. And yesterday's PMQs was just a big row about what sort of oven-ready deal the government said that they, you know, what they were actually meant by deal when they said it. But, I mean... Uh, you know, the, the broad principle that I want to see us have a future relationship with the European Union is it, that has been my position all the way through this. And that is why, you know, despite being attacked and, uh, you know, potentially almost suspended from the Labour Party over it, I not only spoke to, to Theresa May and her government um, about what that deal could look like against the wishes of the then party leader. I also signalled that I would vote for it when she said she would bring it in the form of a bill so that we could amend it. Unfortunately, she was then ousted before she brought it. And I voted for Boris Johnson's withdrawal agreement before the general election as well. So I think I've got a history of trying to make this work. And, um, you know, from my point of view, this becomes even more important in the next few weeks because we've left the EU and that question is now settled. We left in January, we're leaving the transition period in the next few weeks, but our future lies with Europe on security, defence, on trade, on the environment, 
on all of these areas, on dealing with Russia, China, Iran, we are allied with our friends and neighbours across the European Union, and we've got to strengthen that relationship. If you want no more proof of that, look at what's just happened with the election of Joe Biden in the United States and the very strong message that he sent to this government that if they want to have a strong relationship with the US, then it relies on us having good relations with the EU. And we should have always been there. It's astonishing that it took a president-elect of the United States to stand up for British interests over their own government. But that is what a future Labour government would do if I were Prime Minister for the day. Do you think, you know, in hindsight, you should have voted for Theresa May's deal and got it over the line? Because it would have been a softer Brexit, wouldn't it? I couldn't have voted for the, the just the straight sort of up-down vote that she was promising. I said that to her in Jan... God, it feels like longer than this, but it was January 2019 when she rang and asked if I would come and have a conversation with a few other Labour MPs, and we first met. And I'd always said to her, I cannot vote for um, a straight, you know, we're leaving and uh, we're setting sail for uncharted territory until you lay out what that territory is. We had no guarantees about what came next, whether it was a customs union, about the border between Ireland and Northern Ireland. Um, and so w w one of the things that I and many others urged her to do was to put that into a bill. If she put it into a piece of legislation, we said we would vote for it. It took until August of that year for her to agree to do that. And then she was ousted a couple of weeks later. But I did say at that point, I would vote for it. And I think if we could have got there quicker, I think we might be in a different place. But of course, everybody, you know, everybody's made mistakes in this process. The big mistake I think I made, to be honest, was voting for that referendum without any kind of um, safeguard or guarantees um, in the first place. I didn't actually vote for it because I didn't agree with it, but I should I should have voted against it. That that's that's one of my biggest regrets. I, I abstained in the end out of deference for the party. But and I argued against it. But I just think we put the British public into an impossible position. And when we got the result, it was obvious that all we'd done was managed to bring to the surface huge divisions that were not going to be easily resolved. And I think I should have I should have made a bigger stand at that point rather than just saying, I think we're getting this wrong. But, you know, we've all made mistakes. And the, the key now is to look forwards and to say, you know, where does Britain lie in the world and how are we going to make sure that we continue to thrive outside of the EU? Just lastly and briefly on this, do you accept that Labour can't abstain on, on this deal? When a deal comes back, if a deal comes back, Labour has to appear decisive. You can't just sit on the fence with it. Well, I mean, we, we can abstain. Um, we can abstain, we can vote for it, we can vote against it. I mean, it's it's up to us. I mean, apart from anything else, because the government doesn't actually need to bring a vote on the Brexit deal. If they bring a vote, it will be because they want to signal that they've got um, they've got the support of Parliament in order to do it, rather than any legal necessity to, to win win the support of Parliament. But I think you're right to say that it does. It, it is really important what we do, and that's one of the reasons why Rachel Reeves and I have been doing a huge amount of work across the party to, you know, to test to, to test people's mood. I think there's a feeling, a general feeling, whatever people feel about the particular vote, that we've got to move forwards and that our future lies with Europe and that we've got to start building on that cooperation. And a general feeling from our EU friends and partners, particularly our sister parties across Europe, who I speak to regularly, that they want that future cooperation. And so Labour's support in that and signalling that we support it would be a really enormously positive and helpful and healthy thing going forwards. I mean, as a party, we've stayed in the the Party of European Socialists, the progressive grouping. Um, we continue to meet with our progressive counterparts regularly. We are determined to repair those relationships, even as the government continues to trash them. And we're not going to wait till 2024. So I think this vote is important to us. It's very important to us. But we've got to see what they bring back. And at the moment, I'm just, you know, starting to look really quite concerning that there may be nothing, nothing to vote for at all that would be a disaster well it just means that in january we'll just have to start all of this again and i just think the british people can't take much more of it okay well look as prime minister there are other things on your plate apart from brexit not least of all the pandemic and we've got re the review date next week for the tier system that came in after the english lockdown do you want the northwest to go down to tier two now and as prime minister do you think you'd move them down i would be really guided 
not just by what the sage scientists are saying, but also what local public health directors are saying. My own in Wigan, Kate Ardern, leads for uh, Greater Manchester. We've been in lockdown since the end of June. She is absolutely aware of the toll that this is taking on people's mental health and on business and people's livelihoods. But we've been here before. We came out of lockdown in Wigan because some of the local Tory MPs um, kicked off about the decision to put us into the Greater Manchester lockdown. We then found that people travelled from across Greater Manchester to come to Wigan, uh, to go to the pub and to, you know, to socialise. We, we then ended up with the highest rates in Greater Manchester. I think we've just got to be guided by what those people, very close to what's happening on the ground, are saying about the health implications. Otherwise, we could be in a really, really bad place come January. When you look at the rates now, I mean, London has higher rates than many places that are in Tier 3 now. And of course, London, as we're speaking, is in Tier 2 currently. Does that seem fair to you? Do you think London needs to move up now if we're going to actually have a system that is genuinely fair? I just, I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't wish what's happened to us in, in the north of England on anyone, to be honest. I, I don't really see it as a zero-sum game where if we've got to put up with this, then London has to put up with it. But I was listening to Sadiq Khan the other day saying that there's a decent chance that London will move up. And I think if I were, you know, if I stepped out of my role as Prime Minister and became Mayor of London for the day, I guess what I would be saying is if this is what it takes to um, keep people safe um, and stop our hospitals from being overwhelmed, then we'll do whatever it takes. But I would also be saying to them what we've been saying in the north of England for ages, which is we need far more help. We need far more support. We need we need government to take seriously, not just issues around business, but also like schools. I was talking to local head teachers yesterday. Uh, we've Because we've got such high rates up in the north, we've got young people who are taking their GCSEs next year who've missed eight of the last 13 weeks of schooling because they have to keep repeatedly self-isolating. The government promised to level up the north of England and yet what we've got is a situation where the next generation of young people are having their life chances absolutely undermined because of a lack of care and thought from the centre. So if I were Prime Minister for the day, I would absolutely be setting that right. I'd be taking all that power, you know, the, the national tuition programme, for example, and I would be handing that to leaders in the north and to the schools and saying, you decide how that money is spent. OK, well, look, you can see the clock ticking down on us here. We need to do some quick fire questions to finish off this oh, podcast. No. Firstly, as Prime Minister, yeah, you love a quick fire question. Um, which former Labour leader would you call first for advice? I would call the one we never had, Barbara Castle. She once said, in politics, guts is all. And I think we'd need, I'd need plenty of guts if I was going to railroad through an agenda to transform Britain in 24 hours. OK, excellent. Where would you go on holiday as Prime Minister? Um, probably, uh, it would have to be... Um, it have to be somewhere like Southport, I think. People always say, I'm going to staycation, and then they all go to Cornwall. I love Cornwall, by the way, so don't send me angry emails from Cornwall. But it's about time we had some British Prime Ministers holidaying in the north of England. OK, excellent. What song would you dance to at party conference? Toxic by Britney Spears, obviously. It's, it's an absolute tune. A few years ago, I was asked this and I said, we are never, ever, ever getting back together by Taylor Swift. But I think we've left that behind. And I think toxic is a good way of saying enough of that sort of politics now. We're just going to gonna have a good time and we're going to come together. <laughs> Excellent. And what would your Downing Street pet be? Pet? Uh, I mean, I'd have enough on my plate, to be really honest, if I was going to be Prime Minister for a day. So I guess maybe something... Like a goldfish? <laughs> <laughs> You'd still have to clean the tank, though. Or maybe there's someone who does that for you when you're Prime Minister. Something I didn't have to walk. <laughs> and lastly, would you ever want to be Prime Minister? I mean, obviously you ran to be Labour leader, so that you must have that amb ambition in you. Is it still something that you would have another shot at in future? I think um, the job that I've got my sights on at the moment is Dominic Robs, and I'm absolutely determined that in four years' time I'm going to be walking into 10 Downing Street to talk to Kia about how we're going to rebuild our influence and standing in the world. Um, I guess for me, the honest answer is I never really wanted to particularly do that. It takes a big toll, and I think particularly if you're a woman, it's you know it's hard. 
but um, I want to change things. And that's why I stood in the leadership contest. And that's why when Keir offered me this job in April, bit of a surprise, thought I might be in a cupboard for the next four years having stood against him. I just absolutely didn't hesitate to say yes. I just, you know, and I feel that Labour's in that place now where we may actually be able to not just win power, but actually use that power for the good of people across this country and flip a settlement that has stuffed people over in towns like mine for about 40 years. And that would be an amazing thing to do. So that's the job I've got my sights on. So Dominic Raab, watch out. Ah, OK, well, on that note, we'll leave the podcast there. Lisa and Andy, thanks so much for joining us. Oh, thank you.